so it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon to talk to everybody and uh, it's fantastic to be able to give you an update on Space Park Leicester. My presentation is going to be divided into two halves. We, I'm going to give you the update on the Space Park and its progress, why we're doing it and, and where we are with it. And then I'm going to talk a little bit after that about why it's important to go into space. What are the benefits of space to humanity as a whole and including ourselves how do we all benefit from being able to access space uh, and use the facilities that we put there so space park leicester has been um, a development that's now been going on for just about five years almost exactly five years when we came up with the concept and started talking to our prospective partners about it and Space Park really arises from more than 60 years of activity in the university. And some of you may have been well aware of the space activities when you were here in Leicester. And space research in Leicester first began in 1960 uh, when Professor Ken Pounds, who's the, the left person in this small diagram, which uh, shows two people, I'm not quite sure what they're examining. And uh, he certainly got a very good taste in Czech blazers. But Kane Pounds came to Leicester as a junior lecturer in 1960 and started a space research program that's grown continuously since then uh, and now accounts for something like 300 people actually working in the university. And in the 1990s, we developed into planetary science and Earth observation from the early astronomy days, and we won the Queen's Award for Higher Education in 1994. And the Space Research Centre, which is a building on campus, was built in 1998, and it's been extended twice since then, as our ambitions and our activities have grown. And in 2001, the National Space Centre opened in Leicester, and the university and many of my colleagues uh, were the originators and the founders of this very successful uh, outreach and education facility. And during those 60 years, we've done a lot. This is a, a little slide that captures uh, a selection of more than 90 space missions in which we've been involved, uh, starting with Skylark rockets in 1960, progressing through a range of satellites uh, and coming up closer to today in the bottom line where we're involved with the James Webb Space Telescope, which you'll hear a little bit more about after I've been speaking. We're involved in the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury, which is currently flying to Mercury, having been launched a couple of years ago. It will take another five years to get there, unfortunately, or thereabouts, before we can actually do any science. Uh, we're also involved in the Franklin Rover, the ExoMars project run by the European Space Agency, uh, which will land, launch next year and land about eight months later on the surface of Mars. So there's an enormous amount of activity. And in Leicester, we've had uh, an instrument continuously in orbit of some kind or other since 1967. Nice uh, and at the moment, we have eight active space missions going on where we have an instrument that's actually performing uh, and which we're supporting. But apart from building the hardware, we have uh, a lot of skills development going on. We offer programs in physics and astronomy, uh, covering space science uh, and astrophysics. And we work across the piece from schools uh, and space education at the National Space Centre, all the way through to undergraduate degrees and PhDs and continuing professional development in the university. And we also run an end-to-end -end capability where we work on missions from design and build to operations and finally to acquisition and exploitation of the data. And this is the, the vision that we have for Spacepark that grows out of that. Uh, a few years ago, the then Vice Chancellor, Paul Boyle, was looking for ways to develop the university and he identified space as something that we should be trying to grow. And he set me the task of thinking of what the vision for the future for space at Leicester was. Uh, and we have a, a great portfolio of space activity, but one of the things that we felt we should be doing more of was to work more closely with industry and try to feed the fantastic research and innovation that we do into the space economy. 
because the space economy is going to be very important in the next decades for the UK as a whole. And as a world leading space research center, we are setting out to develop a world leading hub for space and what we would call the space enabled industry, which covers building things and putting them into space all the way through to taking data from Earth observation satellites and turning data into valuable activities and services and products that can help the economy. And the real unique thing about Spacepark is that the buildings that we're going to put up will actually be shared by academics and business people together, occupying the same space and sharing the same facilities. And this hasn't happened anywhere else. It's a unique thing, and we think that will be a tremendous advantage in developing research and innovation programs with our industrial partners. And it particularly points to developing new ways of getting into space, lowering the costs of access to space, and essentially making it more democratic in a way so that more people, more companies, and particularly smaller companies, can actually take part in the space business. Another aspect is developing our use of Earth observation data uh, and making it more effective in commercial applications and services and helping grow businesses. So we have a number of priorities, priorities in the space park, and one of these is collaboration. It's to bring a critical concentration of expertise. We, as I said earlier, we have more than 300 academics and researchers doing some kind of space research in the university across all departments in the, in the College of Science and Engineering, but also a number of departments in the other two colleges as well. We're also, developing our innovation. And it's important to uh, make our innovation infrastructure grow to support the space economy. And we're intent on becoming a major player, not just in the region and developing jobs in the region, but also at national level, being part of a national network of uh, innovation areas. I already talked a little bit about education. The university has about 20,000 students, uh, and I would say that about a quarter of those 5,000 students are doing some kind of space relevant education. Uh, and this training uh, part of our activities is going to be very important for developing skills in the sector. Demand for people in the space sector is enormous. Uh, and of course, it's competing with other high tech industrial areas for staff and there are great shortages. And therefore it's important for us to work on filling those. Uh, and the last part of this is co-location. Uh, we're growing a space cluster by building university owned buildings uh, adjacent to the National Space Center uh, and drawing in businesses to, to share our space, but also larger businesses to come and co-locate and build their own buildings in that area uh, and create a cluster that has a world-class set of facilities, as well as a world-class location. This image shows um, a schematic drawing of the layout of the area uh, that's called Pioneer Park. And Pioneer Park is the area of the city that's a lot of it's run and owned by Leicester City Council, uh, but they are intent on developing Pioneer Park essentially as a space park alongside the university. Uh, and those of you who visited this area will recognize the National Space Center. I hope you can see my arrow, which I'm just circling around that, which is an existing facility near the Brown buildings, which are the pumping station, which is a, a piece of industrial archaeology. And then on the other side of the pumping station is the location for the specific University of Leicester Space Park buildings. But alongside this development, the city is building incubator space, the two dock facilities down on the bottom towards the left here uh, are already built and are open for business. And then these other buildings that are shaded in white are potential developments in the future as we bring in more investment to develop this area, which is going to result in, in several thousand jobs and importantly, high tech jobs for the city and for the region, which is an issue for Leicester where we have relatively low numbers of high technology and high skilled jobs, 
to retain the graduates from our various universities. Space Park Leicester plays into very strongly into a wider strategy. Uh, we are fortunately part of an enterprise zone called Waterside. Waterside Enterprise Zone is two sections, the uh, zone a Pioneer Park that we will reside in, as well as an area around Frog Island, uh, close to the centre of Letter, Leicester. And we're also going to be very close to the East Midlands Freeport development that will open uh, in the next year or so. We're also very well connected into government. So we are part of uh, a large government program uh, promoting investment in the UK, uh, and in particular investment in space, which is a key element of that investment program. Uh, and we feature in many of the uh, activities that go on overseas, uh, mostly virtual at the moment, but uh, before COVID, there were a number of trade fairs and visits to places like China and India, where Leicester featured very strongly through the space park development. Let me talk now a little bit about how we fit into the national picture. So we aim to be part of a national infrastructure. We're not competing with other areas because the UK needs uh, a very uh, integrated, not necessarily locally integrated, but intellectually integrated structure. Uh, and the, the UK map that I have on the right hand part of this image highlights the location of Leicester and some of those other areas of uh, critical mass. For example, Harwell hosts the National Space Test Facility and the Satellite Applications Catapult, along with a number of space businesses. We have horizontal launch services being grown in Newquay around the airport down there, as well as satellite communications at Goon Hilly. Uh, we also have Surrey that specialise in small satellites, Glasgow in micro satellites and electronics, and also vertical launch facilities, the first in the UK being developed at Sutherland. And Leicester fits into that by complementing these, uh, where we concentrate on exploitation of data and image processing and manipulation, as well as production tools for building satellites, for making robotic assembly possible, for example, and bringing down the costs and increasing the volume of production. And this is where Space Park comes in, doing the research and development that will enable all this. So what is Space Park? Space Park is a state of the art, or will be, it's not quite complete, uh, 10,000 square meters approximately science innovation and commercial infrastructure, which provides new office space for us and our partners, provides new laboratories that we will share with our partners, as well as high performance computing facilities, uh, co what we call concurrent design facilities, which are essential for developing spacecraft, as well as facilities for developing prototype manufacturing processes. Uh, and uh, an architect's impression of Space Park uh, at night is shown in this bottom left of these four images. Uh, the top left is the Bepi Colombo X-ray spectrometer that's currently uh, in flight on its way to Mercury. And here is a real image of Space Park uh, taken just a few days ago. Space Park is nearly finished. Uh, what we're seeing here is what we call the phase one building. Uh, just hidden slightly out of sight on the left is the phase two building. Uh, and phase two is coming slightly later because uh, we raised the money for that 13.75 million from Research England as a major contribution a little bit after we got the money for phase one from the local growth fund. Uh, phase one, we're now in the process of uh, doing finishing off the landscaping. We took possession of the building formally on March the 30th, i.e. we have the keys. Uh, and phase one will actually open for business will be occupied by members of the university and our collaborating businesses from July the 1st. Phase two will open in November uh, and is roughly the same size as phase one, but phase one actually contains all our laboratory and clean room space, whereas phase one is mainly offices and computational facilities. So one thing I should do before I move on is give a shout out to the architects who designed this really nice building, uh, Shepard Epstein Hunter, and I did take a sneaky, sneaky look at the participants list, and I see that Steve Pidwell, uh, the architect who worked on this with us, 
I think is one of the attendees of this particular talk. So I, we can all give him a sort of uh, a slightly silent but metaphorical round of applause for the building design work. It was a fantastic piece of collaboration. So I'm going to stop sharing because we have a really nice animated video, which is a combination of real live footage and uh, digital animation that show you what Space Park looks like. So thank you for that. So I should be able to reshare my screen uh, and continue this. So I hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation about the space park. Of course, why, why are we doing this is a, a key question. Uh, and the next part of my talk is I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the economic and societal imperatives for working and uh, developing space. Uh, so this little bit of a talk is called What Space Done For Us? Uh, following from Adam Hart Davis's Whatever Have the Romans Done for Us uh, series of uh, programmes uh, a few years ago, maybe decades ago now. So what are the reasons for, for going to space? They are various. Um, the original reason that started the whole thing really was politics. Uh, US versus the Soviet Union, uh, about political capital, uh, fears about nuclear weapons and all kinds of things. And that drove very intense uh, race to the moon during the late 50s and through the 1960s, towards the end of that de decade. But along the way, we, we realized that there were other really good things that we could do. So exploration, we could find out about the solar system. And I'm sure you'll have seen some of the fantastic stuff coming from Mars recently with the Perseverance rover, which is shown in this bottom left picture, as well as this amazing little helicopter that they've been flying around in the last few weeks. Being in space is also a good vantage point uh, for looking out at the universe, uh, getting outside the atmosphere uh, with our telescopes, allows us to do things that we can't do from the ground, look at wavelengths like ultraviolet light and x-rays that don't penetrate the atmosphere. Uh, but it's also great for looking down at the Earth. You get a, a sense of perspective that you can't get from in situ measurements on the ground. And you can get whole Earth coverage and take an integrated view of how the planet is behaving. And this is very important for things like understanding climate change, uh, as well as uh, uh, more detailed things like working on agriculture. And I'll talk about some of these things a bit later. And then alongside that, we can actually grow our economy with it. Uh, space is a massive part of our economy now. It's not realised just how uh, important it is, I think. Um, we get launch vehicles, satellites, uh, that led to miniaturization of electronics and a lot of innovation that finds its way into other parts of our economy. Uh, and the space industry as a whole is worth about £16 billion a year to the UK, uh, and it's about hundred billions, hundreds of billions of pounds per year around the world. So there's a lot at stake for developing the space economy. 
So space is a great key to strategic and economic development across the world. Uh, it gives us a lot of soft power by being involved in space. Uh, and people often say, well, why should countries that are short of money spend money on space? Actually, it's very often cheaper for them to spend money on space to develop their economy than it is to put in ground-based infrastructure. Uh, a country like India, for example, has a large area and it's very difficult and expensive to link all parts of that country together. But by putting a few satellites up to help their communications uh, and to uh, help their infrastructure, they can actually do more for less money. So, so it's a, absolutely a cornerstone of development, not just for rich Western countries like ours, but also for emerging economies uh, and even the poorer economies. Uh, the demand for space systems worldwide was predicted to reach about $1.5 trillion by last year. Uh, and I haven't yet seen the outcome of the measurements, but I'm sure it will be very close to that. Partly because of this, uh, the UK government has made space a big priority in the last few years. It's created the UK Space Agency, which is now just over 10 years old, and it's increased its investment in space. Last year, it created something called the National Space Council, which actually will operate across government, bring all parts of government together that have an interest in space. Uh, an indication of the political importance of this is that they last year bought a 500 million pound stake in a satellite company called OneWeb, partly because the government needs access to manufacturing facilities or manufacturing program like the OneWeb program, but also, uh, OneWeb was a UK company and there was a risk that it would end up being owned by somebody else. And so strategically, the government decided they had to take a stake in it to keep control. So when we talk about space economy, that we talk about three areas, really. Upstream uh, is where we build things like large satellites that you see in the right hand image, put them into space and we operate them. But we don't put them up for their own sake. They might be nice pieces of technology, but they're up there to do a job. And that job is to take data. Uh, it could be looking out or it could be looking down, uh, but the use of that data and the application of that data is what we call the downstream part of the economy. Uh, and actually the downstream part of the economy is far more valuable than the upstream one. That's where most of the economic activity will be. Uh, in the next few years and decades. And then a third aspect of this is what we call space enabled. Space enabled is where we take technology that was developed for space, but we find applications on the ground uh, and in other parts of the economy and other parts of society. So it's what you would like usually call spin out. And we have a satellite and spacecraft industry with many companies, some of them are listed here. Uh, but also we have a lot of software and subsystem companies that provide uh, analysis software, process software, sensors uh, and services. So the company, the, the economy is a complex one, uh, but all these pieces have to be integrated together. And that's one of the roles of space part. And a good example of uh, space enabled is the work that Lester does on sensors. The image at the center here is an X-ray camera, which was developed for flight on uh, a couple of space missions doing astronomy. Uh, the image on the left is one of the uh, pieces of data obtained by this camera uh, from a satellite called Chandra. Uh, and it's about one light year across. And if you look at the right, you see a very similar image taken by the same camera but the same camera sitting in a box of electronics in the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham uh, and taking an image of a labelled mouse tumour. Uh, and the same technology that we use to study the deepest parts of the universe is now in hospitals uh, studying cancers and helping people uh, improve the outcomes from their illnesses uh, and making a massive contribution to health. One of the things you're probably more familiar with is satellite navigation. I know we're not driving very much at the moment. Um, I haven't used my sat now for, for quite some time because I'm not going very far. But satellite navigation is actually delivered to us in our cars and in our boats and elsewhere and in our mobile phones today 
by a constellation of satellites, or about 30 or 40 satellites permanently in orbit around the Earth. Uh, and we get signals from those satellites and we use them essentially to triangulate uh, and discover our location. Without that network of satellites, satellite navigation would not be possible. And we are now completely dependent on it. It's embedded in our economy. Uh, and without a space program, this amazing use of technology, which is now driving a lot of applications and services would not be available to us. I've already talked a little bit about Earth observation, but I'm gonna give you some examples of what we do. Um, having satellites in space able to look down on the Earth is very important for us. Yes, you can measure things in situ on the ground, but if you're on the ground, you can only measure things very locally. Whereas from space, you can get much greater coverage uh, and therefore you can see what's going on over larger areas, but also you can measure it uh, continually in time as well. Uh, and a couple of examples, or well, three examples here of, of what we can do from space. So, so the uh, left image, lower left image here is a heat map. Uh, and you can see the red areas and the yellow and green areas. And so basically the red areas are where people's houses or buildings don't have particularly good in, in, insulation uh, and they're allowing heat to escape. So you can use data like this to target people who need to upgrade the insulation in their houses uh, and therefore encourage those people to improve their energy losses and therefore contribute to saving the climate by lowering the costs of heating. Uh, Interestingly, this is also a great way of detecting cannabis farms because the heat output from a cannabis farm is absolutely enormous. And so not only do we get a, a commercial and economic benefit from the point of view of climate control, uh, we also can fight crime. <laughs> so there's a happy spin off from that. Uh, on the bottom right, the, this is a, a map of air pollution. This is actually Leicester, Leicester city centre. Uh, the city centre is here. Here's Narborough Road. Here's the Aylston Road, uh, the motorway uh, over this side here. Uh, and what we're mapping here is nitrous oxide, which is uh, a tracer of pollution. Um, now, sometimes we can't necessarily do much about it because we can't necessarily control traffic flow. But if we feed this data back into the system, then we can see how traffic flow control increases that level of pollution. And we can put algorithms in place to adjust and to uh, improve that. But also where we see concentrations, we can also infer, inform GP surgeries and health systems to look out for cases, uh, breathing difficulties uh, and other medical issues associated with exposure to this pollution. So we can also help from a medical perspective as well. And then probably one of the, the biggest questions and biggest issues that we have to deal with uh, in our lives at the moment is climate. Uh, we monitor, we've been monitoring weather, such as in this left-hand picture from satellites like Meteosat now for decades. And pretty much all our weather forecasting comes from space-based observations. Uh, but we've also been monitoring the state of the planet. And this, this bottom central image is a heat map of the oceans of the Earth. Uh, and sea surface temperature is, an, is a, a really good proxy for measuring the temperature of the planet. Uh, obviously, it varies seasonally, but we can smooth out the seasonal variations and then study the change of sea surface temperature over decades and see how it's evolving. Uh, and the top right map, uh, graph rather, shows a plot of the global average temperature derived from data like this from 1880 up to just about the present day. Uh, and this provides us one of the key evidence bases for knowing that the climate is changing and that the Earth is warming up uh, to drive that climate change. Uh, and data like this produced at the University of Leicester will feed into the uh, COP26 discussions in Glasgow towards the end of the year. I'm nearly at the end of the talk, so I've just got a couple of slides just to finish. Uh, and now we're possibly moving into a, a more science fiction area, but nevertheless, quite practically in many ways. 
Uh, the left-hand image that I'm showing you is uh, actually a pair of images from space of Fukushima. Uh, the one on the left is what Fukushima was like uh, at one time, and then the one on the right is Fukushima immediately after the, the famous tsunami that took place almost uh, a decade ago. Uh, and what you can see is the enormous amount of inundation of the area. And you might say, well, you couldn't stop this. So, so what's the use of this image uh, showing you what happens after? Well, what happens in a disaster like this is uh, services are completely disrupted. Communications are, are wiped out and nobody knows what's going on. Rapid access to images like this tell you what's going on and they help the emergency services and the support services from the country itself, Japan, but also support from other countries, work out what it is to do, what's the best thing to do, how can we get in there, what is needed, uh, and it has a huge impact on the speed of response and the effectiveness of that response. Uh, the image on the right is a crater. Um, this is a ground-based image of, of crater, uh, but it was produced by an object like the one seen in the bottom right image, which is a small asteroid. And the Earth has been pounded by asteroids and small objects like this uh, over pretty much all its history. Uh, fortunately for us, they're less and less frequent in modern times, but it still happens. This meteor crater in Arizona uh, happened about 80,000 years ago. So within a relatively near geological time. If it had happened today, it would have caused an enormous disaster, uh, probably crippling the entire United States, which is where the crater actually lies, and disrupting much of the world. Now, it's very difficult for us to predict these things, but by surveying space from space using infrared satellites, we can search for the asteroids and catalog them and track them and build up a whole picture of what the asteroid population is like. Uh, and actually, in principle, if we know far enough on our, in advance, we can actually do something about it. Techniques are now being developed to give asteroids like this gentle nudges to just redirect them a little bit so that they don't actually impact on the Earth. And so we can actually uh, we have the prospect in the next sort of decades of being able to protect ourselves from these kind of natural disasters. So I, I hope you've enjoyed that little sort of trot through our uh, reasons for going in space and some examples of what the university is doing in that area. Uh, and as you can see, it's about commercial stuff about making more money for the economy, growing the economy, supporting people by jobs uh, and improving their lives uh, by improving medicine, but also potentially improving their lives by saving their lives from imminent disaster. And to illustrate some of the work that we're doing, we've got a couple of excellent people who work in the School of Physics and Astronomy within our broad space program. Uh, the first of these is Pial Samara Ratna, who's one of my engineering colleagues. Uh, we have a lot of scientists who do the science and interpret the data. But without people like Pial, we would build nothing because it's a rough ride up into space and somebody has to make sure that our equipment is going to survive that ride. It's going to be able to operate in the harsh environment. Uh, otherwise, we won't get any data. And Pial is going to talk to us about one of the most exciting telescopes that we've yet been uh, a contributor to. It's a massive project, it's the James Webb Space Telescope, due for launch uh, later on this year, uh, hopefully in October. Uh, the biggest space telescope ever constructed, and uh, I'm sure it's going to bring us a fantastic amount of new research. Over to you, Pial. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much to everyone who's joined this call. I really hope that you enjoyed joining this, this event. Yes, as Martin has said, you know, um, we, we are involved in a multi-unit space program, and really this is just one example of many that can hopefully just gives you a sense of why we're able to, to undertake and make a success of what will become Space Park Leicester. Uh, I'm the principal engineer of a program called Meteor, and Meteor is the technology development part of 
And as Martin said, you know, I, I, I represent a team of quite a small team of engineers and, and we consistently punch above our weight in terms of delivering some really world-class solutions to space systems. And really, so the example, as Martin said, is, 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 is our, our contribution to the James Webb Space Telescope, which will replace the Hubble Space Telescope. If you haven't heard about this spacecraft, then you will hear about it in the news, uh, certainly because it's about to launch in October this year. I just want to give you an overview of how we've contributed to this. So as Martin has said, you know, our passport to these projects is really based on our heritage. And we're very proud of that, that we've had this heritage of 60 years of building innovative space systems. And um, Space Park is really our, our, our sort of insurance to ensure that that can continue for the next 15 years plus. And, and you know, so, so, so it's vitally important, important for us. And I'm very proud, proud that, that you know, we've been able to do this and hope that it continues. Each of these instruments is really designed to survive in one of the harshest environments imaginable. And, and combined with that, it, it also involves, in most cases, developing technology that never has been done before. And that, that poses a lot of challenges, but Leicester has been incredibly successful in, in, a, in, in meeting those challenges with a successful solution. And that's allowed us really to partake in this really exciting project to replace the Hubble Space Telescope, which is something that is better. And that in itself is a really tough ask, because I'm sure, as everyone knows, the Hubble Space Telescope is, is an amazing, amazing observatory that has generated some amazing uh, astronomy and information that's really brought home how small uh, we are in this universe and how much of the universe is still left to explore. And, and so, so, so trying to come up with a spacecraft that can, that can beat, beat Hubble and be better would have been quite a challenge. But it's things important to know that Hubble itself is hindered by, by its proximity to, to, the, um, to, 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 to the Earth's atmosphere. It has a lot of benefits. It allows it to, uh, it allows it to be maintained and serviced, so it has such a long operational life. But essentially, the Earth's atmosphere clouds its vision. It, and, 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 and that means that it's, it's, it's never quite able to see as clearly as it likes, uh, likes to the, 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 the outside universe. So it's just to give an example of this. If you're very lucky and you look up at the sky at night, you might see a view like this. But really, what you're looking at is 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 is, is the universe through 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 a, what 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 is really a, 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 you know, the atmosphere is acting like a dirty window. Remove that atmosphere, and and then you start to see a lot lot more. And this is really what what the next step for space astronomy is. It's about by trying to go into an area where we are no longer hindered by 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 the atmosphere, and we can see things so much more clearly. And that's what the James Webb Space Telescope is intending to do. So James Webb Space Telescope you know, only does, doesn't only have to go to a place where, 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 where it's no longer hidden by atmosphere, but it also needs to have a, a great seeing eye that it can see as far as possible into the universe. And that's what the design has. So this image here shows the spacecraft and has this giant, huge mirror, twice, twice the size of Hubble, 100 times more powerful. And this enables us to see, see light that originates right back to the start of the universe. And on top of that, it allows it to, to hunt out for, for, for planets that may be supporting life. And this, this is really important for understanding of, of, of our position in the universe. It's so big, about when fully unfurled, about the size of the telescope, it actually has to be folded up. So it's a massive technical challenge just to get it into the rocket so it can launch. And then once released into space, it can then slowly begin this process of about a month, slowly unfurling itself into its final configuration and begin the science. Oh, during this time, it's actually cooling itself down. The idea is, is that it can remove all those localized energies that are, that, that are all, like, like the atmosphere, distorting its view, so you can see really clearly. And that's helped by this huge sun shield, these multi-layer sheets of, of, um, of mylar that, that, that are basically protecting the science instruments and allowing them to get below 40 degrees Kelvin so, so 40 degrees above absolute zero, so that it can, it can do its science. And the instruments that, that, are, that are really driving the science are, are located behind the primary mirror. And they all housed into a structure we call ISIM, the Integrated Science Instrument Module. And there are four science science instruments, uh, FGS, NIRCAM, MIRI, and NIRSPEC. And these are the only four instruments on, on the observatory which will do, do the science output. 
And the, the instrument that I want to focus on is the MIRI instrument, because the MIRI, which is the mid-infrared instrument, is an instrument that Lester has a leading role in. Lester also has, has, a, has a wider role in, 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 in the science or, or across, across the whole observatory. But MIRI is an instrument where we've been really intrinsically involved in engineering. And it's, it's an instrument built by 12 institutes around the world, but Leicester are the lead mechanical engineering organization. We're responsible for ensuring this instrument is mechanically sound, can mechanically survive the launch, it's mechanically um, by thermal, and also do the science. So if you look a bit closer at MIRI, MIRI, this is the CADMOM, which can be a generated model that, that Leicester are responsible for managing. And, and it's about one cubic meter in size, made predominantly of aluminium. And um, light from, from the prime mirror enters the bottom. And then it's, it's brought up into the main science instrument module, where, where at the bottom here on the green is the, is the imager. And then on the top are, are three spectrometer units. The spectrometer units, they, they break the light down to the, into the various wavelengths of light by, by a multitude of mirrors. This instrument itself is, is, is um, you know, really precise. It's uh, sub micron level precision in terms of alignment. But what also makes it very challenging is that it also operates at about six degrees above absolute zero. That means its behavior at, at normal, normal room temperature is very different to how it is, is, is when it's actually operating in space. So all of these, these optics and everything like that has to be designed to be perfectly aligned, but also work, work aligned so that it can work in, in extreme cold environments. Things like the spectrometer will, 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 will output data pretty much like this. Not the most exciting, but essentially what it does, it tells you what, what, what things are made of. And, um, and it's extremely important in terms of the science outputs for, 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 for this observatory. The imager itself, the, the, this green box here, contains the various, various imaging sites, um, aspects to the instrument. And that allows it to, to produce more classical um, images of, of the universe, but at unprecedented levels of detail. And this level of detail is so sensitive that if, if, if it was positioned on Earth, it would be able to detect if someone lit a candle on Jupiter. So on, on the moons of Jupiter, I should say. And, and this you know, is it's a really unprecedented level of detail, really achievable by, by the great science engineering that, 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 that has been integrated to this instrument. And so the current technologies, if you look at, look at um, you know, the latest technology, we look at the, the solar system, you might see a, a blob. But with James Webb, you will be able to see in our present level of detail, you know, we've seen the stars and orbiting planets, and hopefully one of those planets may be supporting life. It would be a great find in space well. In order to prove it works, we at Leicester, the engineering team, have done a huge amount of analysis, looking at every element of it. You know, uh, on the ground, you can only sim you can only sort of represent so much. You can't represent the lack of gravity. The thermal environment is really hard to recreate. So a lot of it is done by computing. And we know we've got great infrastructure tools allow that to happen, to ensure it survives launch and the thermal environment. But then when we've done that, we we also step out and we we, we pick up our tools and basically we start with the building of the hardware as well. People like myself and, and my colleagues, you know, we've been intrinsically involved in tightening the screws and then lining things and making sure that the instrument is fit for purpose. Working, working both at, I mean, Leicester and, and, um, and, and down in Oxford where the instrument was built. Working with a multitude of suppliers, predominantly who are UK based, really, really trying to ensure this instrument delivers on, on what, it, what it's meant to do. We also um, support the uh, by vibration testing. We lead in that, in fact, to, to which basically verifies the instrument can survive launch. It means means subjecting the instrument to, to a really harsh launch environment. The, this is the video here showing the instrument going through that test. The instrument is kept in a, in a clean bag because it's just so sensitive to dust. But it's, an, it's a test that we were able to carry off really successfully. The instrument passed first time without any issues. We also supported the thermal, thermal, thermal testing as well, trying to get instrument down to the operational temperatures to confirm it worked. It takes over a month worth of cooling just to get instrument down to that temperature there, unless they're really supported in, in that and ensure sure that test was perfectly successful. We then also led in the delivery of the instrument to NASA. Um, the, the, the management team for, 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 for MIRI is a UK based uh, uh, Airbus. Were, were, were the company responsible for leading it, and and uh, they, they together oh, themselves also did a really good job in terms of delivering the instrument on time. We were actually over over a year ahead 
of our, of our other sister European instrument, which was delivering the instrument to, to the spacecraft, which was, which was very successful. And then we, we actually had a leading role in integrating that instrument onto the structure that became the observatory. So from here, the, the, observe, the, the ISIM module where all the instruments were, was, was populated with instruments and then loaded onto the, the back plane of the, of the, of the um, observatory. You can see there the primary mirror. These images here show, show the fully assembled um, uh, primary mirror and, 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 and with the scientists in there ready to go towards testing. And you just get a, a sense of the scale of, of, of the spacecraft as it comes together. And, and this was all done at NASA Goddard in, in Washington, D.C. We then, we then supported the, the thermal testing of, 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 the, of the observatory, your, your which, was, which was actually done at the uh, Kennedy Space Center using a chamber like this. A chamber like this, the size and scale of this is yeah, but I think he's, I think he's... Operate. And, and it's um, essentially, um, it costs about $3 million of US money a day to run this chamber. So about $2,000 a minute. So, so when you're when you're operating, uh, uh, trying to confirm that things are working, you're pretty much on a very tight script schedule. If you want to hold up things for for a few minutes, then people are really and get But you know, again, a testament to to the engineering and scientists who have been supporting this. You know, we were able to confirm this what works perfectly fine, and that all allowed us to go towards the final assembly of the spacecraft. It was completed last year. And um, you know, again, you can see the fully unfilled observatory on, on the left here, and the size and scale of this. And, and you know, like I said, so the University of Leicester, as well as other UK organisations, really be intrinsic to ensuring that that, that, that spacecraft uh, has been built successfully. And this is the image on the right, just showing showing the the, the assembly, uh, set, uh, folded up uh, observatory being ready to go. So um, it's certainly not, not down to me. Um, it, I'm, I'm working part of a, a, a team of engineers. We were lucky to actually involve a lot of students as well in this program. We had a number of different student programs here. Um, and, and you know, a testament to them for really supporting the program here. I should also, also compliment the supply chain of, of, um, of, of, of people and companies and organizations who, who built a lot of the hardware. And the, and the majority of those are UK based. And, um, and, you know, it continues, you know, and, and, and you know, we hope that this, this type of activity continue and, and new opportunities that that space industry will bring forward. So um, on the 31st of October, James Webb will, will launch on an Ariane 5 uh, rocket. Um, I'm very proud of Leicester's, Leicester University's involvement in this. Uh, I started this, this project as a, as a newly graduated engineer and I lead this project as, 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 the, as the lead mechanical engineer for the instrument. And I hope, hope that we can offer similar types of opportunities for, for emerging talent, talent through, through opportunities like Space Park Leicester. Instruments like, like MIRI were only really possible through, through, through the engineering and hard work of engineers and scientists um, around the world, particularly at Leicester University. Uh, on the instrument itself, you know, you can see the, the University of Leicester logo that, that, that's, that's proudly uh, embossed on the side there. And uh, I hope that, that, you know, three space park Leicester will be an even more successful program. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope you enjoyed that. And, um, and, and, and you know, uh, when, when you see the news and, and you hear about James Webb, I, I hope, hope you remember, remember Leicester's involvement in this, in this, in this really amazing program. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pierre. I think the uh, 31st of October is going to be day, I think. Uh, it's going to be an amazing day, but also a very nervous one as well. Now, assuming that we successfully get uh, James Webb Space Telescope into space, of course, there's going to be a fantastic amount of data. Uh, and we have uh, a number of scientists who are poised waiting to exploit it uh, and uh, one of those is a uh, tremendous scientist from the into the future when life's certainly gone uh, and uh, one of these is Sarah Casewell I've worked with Sarah for quite a long time on, on a number of things 
And Sarah recently won a very prestigious uh, Ernest Rutherford Fellowship from the Science and Technology Facilities Council, which really marks her out as a future leader in astronomy. And so it's really great for us to have her in the university. And she's going to talk about some of the work that she's doing uh, and how it uh, relates to the James Webb Space Telescope. Over to you, Sarah. Hi, so I am, going to, I am genuinely going to talk about brown dwarfs to you in a minute when my, there we go, the wonders of operating system upgrades that mean I'm not allowed to basically do anything with my laptop. Okay, so I am going to talk to you about brown dwarfs and how they are planet analogs, both for, uh, analogs of planets in our solar system and extrasolar planets. So many of you may not be familiar with brown dwarfs. I certainly wasn't before I did my PhD in them. And they are the lowest mass products of star formation. And what I mean by this is that they form like a star from the collapse of a big gas cloud, but they never end up in a big enough clump to start fusing hydrogen into helium, which is what happens in our sun. And as a result, once they formed, they simply cool and fade with time. And they're physically about the size of Jupiter, so big on our planetary scale, small for a star. And they have masses of between 17 and 70 times that of Jupiter. So they're, they're much denser than your average planet. They have atmospheres that are dominated by molecules. So they're very, they're thought to be very much like Jupiter in that they have carbon monoxide, water clouds like on Earth but also clouds of methane, iron hydrides, and metals that are referred to as dust generally. And because of these similarities to Jupiter, they're often used as exoplanet proxies. So my middle image here is Jupiter taken at three microns, which is possible for Jupiter from the Earth because it's bright. It's not possible for much other stuff from the Earth because the Earth's atmosphere is also bright at this wavelength. And on the right here, these are the HR8799 planets. And the object at the top is HR8799C. And when you look at, when you take a spectrum of that, as Pial was saying, you split the light up and look at what the light's made of, that looks remarkably like the young brown dwarfs we see in this open star cluster over here, which you might recognize as the 100 million year old Pleiades open star cluster. So, our directly imaged exoplanets, as we call them, and brown dwarfs look remarkably similar. Now, the first brown dwarf was actually discovered in about 1992, and this was really only made possible once infrared detectors were created. And all the wonderful science PL's been talking about, the infrared detectors were only really started to be used for astronomy in the late 1980s. The technology is sort of this new. So this spectrum here at the bottom is of an object called GD165b. And it is a brown dwarf companion to a white, a white dwarf, a dead star. Now, this was discovered and the people who found it literally did not know what it was. They, they looked at it and they compared it to these sort of triangles at the top here. And they said, oh, well, we know this is a, a red dwarf, a cool star. Uh, this sort of looks a bit like it, but not really. And it was only much later that we actually realized what it was. And to give you a rough idea of what this system looks like, it's a brown dwarf and a white dwarf separated by about four arc seconds. And this is an image I took with the Gemini 8 meter telescope on Hawaii about three weeks ago of this binary. So later on, there is a very famous conference in 1995 where the announcement of the first ever exoplanet was made by Didier Kelo and Michel Mayor, and they've now won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. But there were also two other discoveries made, announced at this same conference. And these were of the first brown dwarfs. So this is Tady one on the left, which is an L dwarf. This is a very cloudy, dusty object. And it resides in the Pleiades open star cluster. And on the right, we have an object called Gliese 229b. And Gliese 229b was originally discovered from the ground 
um, using coronagraphs, which are new technology at the time, but not so much anymore. So you block the light out from the star to try to see things close by. And this is how directly image exoplanet science works. And you can see the difference between the ground-based image here on the left and the space-based image from Hubble in 95, where you can directly detect the brown dwarf. So in 1995, these objects were initially discovered. Now, we have brown dwarf-like objects in our solar system. This is uh, a Juno image of Jupiter. And we know that they are very, very dynamic objects. They have the, these amazing vortices and clouds and all sorts of uh, incredible images. I'm very jealous of my planetary science colleagues here at Leicester who turn up with their data from Juno and it looks beautiful. And I have these tiny little stars in my images. Um, but we know, so Juno images of Jupiter, we have Cassini images of Saturn, so this is this hexagon, um, seasonal hexagon that appears on Saturn, and even Uranus. So the images on the right are some work that one of my colleagues, Lee Fletcher, recently did with some of our undergraduates as part of a project amalgamating 25 years of images of Uranus to look at how it changes seasonally. Uh, it's a really awesome video. You can see some of the moons transiting um, transiting Uranus and you can see how as it moves around the sun you have this sort of hot hemisphere cold hemisphere swaps which is extremely interesting so the question we then need to ask are well well do brown dwarfs do this too you know I've, I've been trying to convince you they're remarkably like exoplanets and our solar system planets are they really and the answer is yes so this is the imaginatively named Lumen 16b after um, Dr. Lumen, who discovered it. And it has a rotation period of just over four hours, which is what's shown on the right here. And these were taken at about as far infrared as you can get sensibly for the ground for a faint object, at about two microns. So this is much shorter in wavelength than MIRI on James Webb will do but it is longer than Hubble can do. So you can only do this bit from the ground at the moment. Near spec uh, on James Webb will be able to take data not dissimilar to these. And they imaged, uh, they took lots and lots of spectra as the brown dwarf rotated. And when they looked at how it all worked out compared to what the brown dwarf was doing as it went, as it went around its rotation, they found that the clouds, the carbon monoxide clouds, what they were observing, moved in and out of view. So you have the dark patches are thick clouds. This is where you can't see into the atmosphere of the brown dwarf. And the bright bits are where there are holes in the clouds, where you can see deep into the atmosphere of the brown dwarf. So you're looking at what's happening at different layers through the atmosphere as we observe this brown dwarf as it moves around the orbit. And the fascinating thing to me about these things, this is why I got into brown dwarfs in the first place, is that if you return to them a few months later, these cloud patterns are completely different. They change just like those on Jupiter, just like those on um, Earth. So, you know, brown dwarfs have weather. And some of these rotate as fast as almost an hour. They're crazy fast rotators. So the, my last little bit of my talk is about some of the research I'm, I do and what I hope to do with James Webb once it launches. So I research brown dwarfs in orbits with white dwarfs. So white dwarfs are stars are at the end of their lives. Our sun is going to become one in about 5 billion years. No need to worry just yet. So there are only about 30 brown dwarfs known in close orbits with main sequence stars. And um, what's going to happen when the star evolves is the star is going to become, the star will run out of fuel, it'll become a giant. Now, depending on where the brown dwarf is, it's either going to end up inside the giant, and it will spiral inwards, and it will end up in a very tight orbit, or it will get pushed outwards as the star evolves and becomes a white dwarf, almost like surfing on a wave, and it will end up in a very wide orbit. So in our solar system, everything is certainly inside the Earth, maybe even inside Mars, is going to end up inside the Sun when it's a giant. And Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune are likely to move further out to give you a rough idea as to sort of what the different, the distances involved are. It's about 3 AU. 
So there are about 10 of these wide systems known and about 10 of these closed systems known. The most interesting of the white one is the imaginatively named WD0806-661. We do like our telephone numbers in observational astronomy. And this is a Spitzer image. So Spitzer was a half meter telescope that observed at 3.6 microns and 4.5 microns. So slightly shorter than Miri, but you can see the size difference between Spitzer and James Webb. You're looking at something that is only half a meter. This is the white dwarf, and this is its wide brown dwarf companion. And this thing is so faint that we can pick it up with Spitzer and we could pick it up with its successor Wise, but Hubble can't see it. So we've looked and looked with Hubble and Hubble can't detect this thing at all. It's too faint in those wavelengths. And this is one of the prime targets for James Webb. It's on our MIRI guaranteed time observations and on guaranteed time observations for all the other instruments as well, because we want to know what this is. Is it an escaped planet? Is it genuinely a brown dwarf? What's going on in its atmosphere? It has to be one of the coolest brown dwarfs known. And obviously it survived the death of its, of its star, even at this, this really wide distance. So this is an incredibly fascinating object. Some of the objects that are a little bit more close to my heart are the objects that have survived and ended up in those close tight binary orbits. So these look a bit more like the hot Jupiter exoplanets we discover with things like NGTS, which is a, a planet finding telescope system we're involved in. And they're, tight, they're tightly locked. So one side of the brown dwarf always faces the white dwarf. So effectively you have this, this sort of massively toasted side and this side that is cool and faces out into space. And that's what you're looking at. This, this slightly weird diagram on the left is every row is a spectrum that I've taken centered around the H alpha line. So this is the pink line is this very broad line you get in the white dwarf that says it's a hydrogen atmosphere thing. And most white dwarfs are. And the, the funny green line is an emission feature, which is because the brown dwarf is getting hot. So instead of having hydrogen, cool hydrogen that's absorbing light, it's giving out light because it's being heated. And you can see the day side of the brown dwarf here. And it almost fades away at all. The night side, we can't see this emission at all. And then as it comes back around again, you can see the hot side. And this thing is in a two hour orbit. It's super close. So when we were talking about Hubble, some of my binaries, if you put Jupiter on Hubble's orbit, that's essentially the configuration of these systems. My brown dwarf is Jupiter sized. My white dwarf is Earth sized. And they're going around each other in between 90 minutes and two hours. They're absolutely bonkers systems. But one of the most interesting things for me is that when we look at these at the five micron, 4.5 micron, which is the blue curve here, it's far too bright. We don't know why it's too bright. None of the brown dwarf models should say it should be this bright. Even if you heat it up, it shouldn't be this bright. We really don't understand it. And what we think is happening is that there is some sort of glow coming off the brown dwarf, possibly because of all the light from the white dwarf is interacting and breaking up molecules and causing sort of an air glow, a bit like the aurora we see on the Earth. The same sort of effect. And we are only going to be able to probe this with James Webb because we need spectra. We need to look at what's happening in the brown dwarf atmosphere in this wavelength range, which means we need to use MIRI or we need to use NearSpec to actually figure out what's going on. And because James Webb is huge, we can take lots of spectra going around our two hour orbit to actually see how the atmosphere is changing as the brown dwarf moves. Okay, so here is, is James Webb for the sort of technically minded in you, the wavelengths, which is across the bottom. So this is sort of optical light over here, what, I, what our eyes see. J, um, Hubble gives up about here, at this, this point here, about 1.6 um, microns. Hubble can't see any longer than that. We can do to just about two and a half microns here from the ground. Spitzer did about here from three to four and a half. And you can see that Miri is going to cover this whole unexplored region from five up to almost 30 microns. It's gonna be crazy. And this means we have 
almost an unprecedented way of looking at what's going on in not only brown dwarf atmospheres, the model one given here is like the coolest brown dwarf we know today, but also things with disks, star forming regions, anything that gives out lots of light in this region where there are things like silicates um, that we don't really understand. And we've never really had an opportunity to actually directly look at before. So, you know, the opportunities for what we can do Jenk, with, with James Webb is really incredible. We're all extremely excited about it. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Good, good. Thank you, Sarah. So I think we need to hand back to our uh, university uh, alumni office colleagues. Yeah, I can see Rachel's ready. Uh, back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Martin, and thank you um, all of you for those fascinating talks. Um, I'm sure we agree that there's uh, an awful lot of information to take in there. So um, we are a little behind on time, but I hope that people can uh, stick around for a little while just to for us to, to ask a few questions uh, of the panel, if that's OK. Um, so we've had a couple of uh, questions come in with regards to the corporates and the commercial partners that uh, will be occupying space in the uh, in the at Space Park Leicester so um, I don't know if you can kind of give us an idea how much you can tell us at this stage but obviously we I can, I, I can give you a flavour so so we have we have about 25 industrial partners involved with Space Park not all of them will be locating on site some of them are very big companies that have got their own facilities um, but for example we expect Airbus UK to have a footprint on the site and quite a few of the companies that will be co-locating are, are small companies, uh, SME size companies, 200, 250 people. But the importance of the space business is that SMEs are going to be the sort of new drivers of the space business. And so we have a mixture of companies. We do have support from Airbus and from Thales Alenia Space and from Lockheed Martin. Um, but we also have a lot of new companies joining us. Uh, whose names you won't be familiar with. But I have to be a bit careful because we're still in the process of signing the deals. And so I can't make any formal announcements, but we, we are getting close to filling all the space that we have available. That's great to hear, Martin. Thank you. And I obviously appreciate that uh, some of those uh, dotted lines are still to be signed, but thank you for, for giving us a, a bit of an indication there. Um, Victoria Rowe asks, um, will the proliferation of Earth orbiting satellites interfere with observation from Earth-based telescopes and pose an increased risk of damage from space debris to the International Space Station? It is a challenge. Uh, it's, it's a serious risk if we don't do anything about it. And there's quite a lot of work going on at the moment. Yeah, there are two things, and Sarah might wish to comment uh, as a, an observational astronomer. There's the light pollution impact on telescopes uh, with satellites going across the field and uh, harming our observations. And then there's the space debris risk that can cause damage to other satellites. Uh, and uh, that costs money and potentially it could lead to a, a runaway situation where we're not able to use space, at least low Earth orbit space any longer. Yeah, so certainly observing, we already have to be careful of satellites and, and other things. So the, um, the lasers, for instance, at uh, the Very Large Telescope on uh, Paranal in Chile are fantastic and allow us to do wonderful science. But we also are partners in um, NTTS, Next Generation Transit Survey, which is located there. And we can't, if the lasers are observing in a certain direction we can't observe that way because we have um beautiful green light across all of our images it's not ideal um we don't mind that so much because it's sort of in the pursuit of astronomy and there's lots of other directions we can look at but there are big deep surveys such as um the vera rubin observatory is going to observe and it's a cadence survey so it's going to take two or three images of the same piece of sky every night. And you can imagine if you have these things going around, if they're in low Earth orbit, they're going around once every 90 minutes. That's lots of trails you're gonna get across your deepest star image ever, which is not helpful. So certainly the, 
the big constellations of satellites are massively a concern at the moment. Yeah, like I think to add on, on to that, like from my side, we're coming up with new space missions uh, all the time. And, and now a major part of, part of when you design a space mission is thinking about the end of life. And that's something that historically hasn't really been happened before. You know, spacecraft being left to orbit freely and then do things that, that we haven't really wanted to do to litter, so to speak. And now, now we have to ensure that these spacecraft now do deorbit and the end of life is done in a safe way that does cause them to burn up on the Earth's atmosphere and don't cause the problems. Um, I think there are a lot of problems, but, but in terms of how we manage the growth in space, but I think everyone so far is working together with a proactive attitude. You know, a lot of these things are providing essential services you know, to, you know, that are really adding value. So we have to find the balance there. But um, you know, there are plenty of good solutions coming away as well. Thank you all for that. So um, next question, I think, will be for you, yourself, Pierre, but obviously um, do uh, comment to you guys. Um, how will you ensure that the JWST mirror will focus accurately and not suffer the same problem as Hubble, which required adjustment whilst in space? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it's, a, it's a good, good question, yeah, because we, we certainly can't repeat that. If anything, like James Webb is going to a place where you can't service in the same way. Uh, but there are a number of things. I think the uh, first thing is less lessons learned, applying lessons learned. Let's not make the same mistake twice. And, and so there's a lot of ground-based testing sure that the end of life. The other thing is that James Webb, you've got these great big mirrors. Behind each of them is a, an actuator, which is which is basically able to pull that mirror to different shapes. So it can actually actively change its focus and, and, you know, and can actually adapt to changing requirements. So if, there's, if there is something a little bit unexpected, then, then James Webb can adapt to that. So it does have that inbuilt resilience, but uh, yeah, a lot of it's down, down to a lot of extensive testing. Sure. Um, okay, I think we've got time for one final question, but I'd like to um, to put this to each of you, uh, if that's okay, because I think it's a really good one. Um, so Jack said, there's a lot of great innovation that's come out from space um, with a lot of work, um, Oh, sorry, um, I beg your pardon. Uh, Jack said, sorry, I find the concept of spin outs that arise from space research fascinating, um, which I think we'd all agree. Um, but what do you each think is the greatest innovation to come out of space research? <laughs> you can fight over who uh, would like to. <laughs> <laughs> who can come up with an answer fastest? That's a really challenging question. I can I can go. So there's there's lots of stuff that has made a big difference to our lives. You know, the obvious ones that always get trotted out are Velcro, Teflon, for your nonstick pans, all this sort of stuff came out of space. I think my favorite, and certainly now in the middle of a pandemic, absolutely my favorite has to be um, the detectors, CCD detectors. Yeah, you know, these things my PhD supervisor used to physically have to make his one detector and take it to the telescope to take observations with it. And this was in the late 80s. It's, you know, with certainly within my lifetime, I was born in 82. And now I, I have one on my desk, you know, it's, it's in my phone, it's in my laptop, it's in stuff all over my house. So I really do think, you know, CCDs and these detectors have revolutionized a huge part of our life and a lot of it did come from astronomy i i think i i wouldn't pick out a single item as such and i think i'd actually go refer you back to my talk because i think one of the greatest things that has come out of space has been the challenge to make things small has driven a huge amount of miniaturization which wouldn't have happened or at least not happened nearly so quickly without the imperative you, you, it's expensive to put things in space, so there has to be as small as possible and as light as possible and as robust as possible. So, so microelectronics are really a product of the space age. So it's another contribution to Sarah's mobile phone. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I definitely agree, agree with those things. Like I've said on the chat, um, GPS and the improvements of weather, just, weather itself, like just because it has such an immediate impact and people can immediately see the benefit you know, through, through things that help them. I would also just add a slightly left field thing, you know, to a spin out thing. One of the first ever mechanical heart support devices was developed by NASA engineers. 
So, so that the idea of miniaturization and building high robust things, you know, for space can can inadvertently go and go in some really interesting directions. People like myself are actually part employed by the British Heart Foundation to develop medical solutions. So, um, you know, the spin outs that can come up from space is really strong and, and certainly shouldn't be in the balance. Fantastic. Thank you all so much um, for that. So I'm afraid that's all that we've got time for um, this evening, unfortunately. Um, but it just remains really for me to um, to thank our speakers. Um, there's been lots of uh, positivity in the chat, so I hope that uh, everybody's enjoyed it as much as that suggests. I'm, I'm sure that they have. And so thank you very much to Martin, Sarah and Pierre for joining us this evening uh, and to you all, obviously, for, for being with us uh, tonight as well. Uh, do please try to um, complete the evaluation form. Um, there's a link in the chat at the moment and we'll also send that link to you by email too. Um, that helps us to make sure that these events keep getting uh, better and better. We understand what uh, what people like, what people don't like, and, and we use that feedback um, very, very much to, to continue to, to make our Festival of Change events uh, increasingly successful. So once again, thank you everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. We hope to see you at another Festival of Change event soon. Thank you very much.